extra, I'm so excited tonight. We have an extra special person um, who's here. Rebecca Rohde is our newest um, employee at the Portage Park District. Um, she just started today. And so I asked her to come on in so you can get used to seeing her face. So give a wave, Rebecca. Hi, We're everyone. so excited. <laughs> We're so excited to have her. Um, she's going to be part-time working with both Andrea and I as our education outreach specialist. She's going to be primarily working with volunteers and doing some um, education programming too, as well as a whole host of other things. All right, well, let's get started tonight. Get this show on the road. Um, welcome to Beavers. We're talking about the busy beavers in Portage Parks and across the state. And my name is Jennifer White. I'm the education program coordinator with the Portage Park District. And let's just talk a little about what we're what the plan is for tonight. So first, we're going to talk about some we share some facts about beavers, both in general, and then some population stats for the state of Ohio, some of the most current information that we have from the Division of Wildlife. Uh, I'm going to share some of the neat physical adaptations that these creatures have that allow them to thrive in this area and to be able to successfully reproduce and create their colonies. We'll share some fun info about beaver behaviors. They have an amazing life cycle and family structure, which is really neat. Also, I'm gonna share about the ecological impact that beavers have on the environment. It's pretty impressive, their role in both in Ohio and across the country. And finally, we'll end with some conservation and management information. I'm curious if you're uh, on the webinar tonight, if you wouldn't mind typing in the chat box whether your experience with um, beavers so far um, has been positive or negative. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious where, or maybe you're just curious about them in general and you haven't had a, a positive or negative experience because we definitely in Northeast Ohio have a real mix of human interactions with uh, this cool rodent. So please, pop that into the, the chat box. I'm just kind of curious to see where everybody is tonight. So let's get started on the American beaver. Castor canadensis is the only beaver that's found in North America, and that's the American beaver. It's the largest rodent in North America. It unfortunately is not the largest rodent in the world. It's in second place, but it's just right behind South America's capybara. And the American beaver gets to be an average of 30 to 40 pounds, although they can go upwards of 70 pounds. And the uh, world record, at least documented, was over 100 pounds beaver. That is a large rodent. So the capybaras on the other side, they average between 70 and 140 pounds. So there's a pretty significant size difference there. But this is still by far the biggest rodent that we have in North America uh, and definitely the biggest one in, uh, in Ohio. <laughs> Now, these guys are primarily crepuscular. So if this is, if you're new to this term, um, you probably are familiar with nocturnal or diurnal. So nocturnal means the animals mostly active at night when it's dark out, and diurnal means the animals mostly active during the day. Crepuscular means that this is an animal that starts getting active just before dark, so around dusk, and is active through dawn. So while the beavers are active at night, if you are looking at your best chances to see them out and about at our parks, you're going to want to go just before dusk, which we don't close until dusk, and then just after dawn, which we don't open till dawn. So um, that, that makes it perfect. So please uh, get out there and check them out. That said, if you've been on a hike with me at Seneca Ponds Park, where we have the most frequently observed beaver family, then you know that they are active during the day as well. So just like everything else in nature, uh, you can't really fit it into um, a tight box. So <laughs> you've got to make sure that uh, you understand that they could be, they could push against those rules and they often will be active during the daytime. So if you're taking a hike around, I've seen them often around lunchtime, you take a hike around Seneca Ponds, you'll see them out doing repair work on their uh, their engineering projects. All right. In general, I just wanted to talk about diet with the beavers because a lot of people assume because we see all that gnawing. Um, if you look behind me here, I have our little friend. If you visited us at the our Portage Park District office, you know that he, this guy usually lives at the office, um, but it's here tonight with us. And so because we see all these beaver logs, we think, oh, they eat wood, but they actually don't. <laughs> they, they don't eat wood at all. Uh, they eat 
uh, mostly leaves, that would be their preference, like those nice juicy long, young leaves, um, new shoots, the bark off of uh, younger wood or limbs of the trees. They'll also eat berries and even mushrooms and things. So, but they are herbivores. They're solely herbivores. They're not um, omnivores or carnivores. And they, uh, don't, they don't eat that wood, at least not on purpose. They're just using that to be able to get to the fur or to get to the, the food. All right. And finally, and this is so important and also so cool. The beaver is considered a keystone species. So what's a keystone species? It's an animal that has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment. And so what I mean by that is that without the keystone species, the ecosystem would either be dramatically different or it would cease to exist entirely. Now what's interesting about this particular keystone species is that most of the time they are apex predators. So things like wolves, for example, if you've never read up on, or if you haven't heard about the story of the uh, of Yellowstone National Park and the introduction, the reintroduction of uh, wolves there. Really interesting how that keystone species has impacted um, the environment there and the, the landscape. Uh, so, and actually beavers are part of that, that whole story too. So that's worth a read for a different day that we're in Ohio. And <laughs> the, and the uh, keystone species here is not an apex predator. In fact, it's the only animal that completely re-engineers and redesigns its environment. I mean, it physically changes it. It doesn't just have an impact on the other things that live in that environment. It physically changes it. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to share a little bit more about that as we, as we progress. But first, let's talk about Ohio. Let's talk about the Ohio beaver population. Now, this graph is taken from the 2019 Ohio Division of Wildlife's beaver population report. If you want to learn in depth, and it's really fascinating, it's only four pages, it's a summary of the Division of Wildlife's population report. You can just Google that and um, it'll bring up your the, the four page uh, report. And it's really fascinating because it talks about how they uh, decide on survey areas, how they conduct the survey, they do aerial um, surveys, and they're actually looking at beaver colonies based on the um, aerial photography and the aerial look of the, um, uh, of the landscape. What they estimated, in 2019 that there were 4,747 colonies of beavers. We'll talk more about what colony means. It's basically the family of beavers. Uh, so they estimated that that's how many colonies are in the state of Ohio. You notice that if you look at the trend line, while generally it's trending up, 2019 was to take a little bit of a dip, that estimated colony number translates into an estimated 27,000 plus beavers in the state of Ohio. Now what's interesting about that is that Northeast Ohio has a much higher concentration of this rodent than any place else in the state. And that's for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is uh, that we have a lot of uh, existing wetlands and uh, wetter soils, lots of streams. If you look at the state uh, watershed map of the state of Ohio, in Northeast Ohio, we have so many cool little streams and tributaries, and that's all prime habitat for beavers. So let's talk about some of these cool adaptations. First, fur and grooming. Here we have a picture of a beaver in winter. Beavers do not hibernate. We don't see them as often, but they are still there. They are still eating, they are still working. Um, we'll talk a little more about why we don't see them as much later in the presentation, but they get wet and one would think cold <laughs> in the winter. <clears throat> to me, that guy looks really cold. Turns out he's protected by this really nice uh, beaver pelt. So beavers have two different layers of fur. I'll try and do a close-up shot here for you. One layer, like right in the center here, is this small, short, really dense, really soft um, hairs. And then there's longer, smoother, um, shinier uh, hairs that are that are on top of that. And that thick double layer of fur is uh, designed to keep the beaver super warm. That and its extra bulk for the uh, for the winter. So that keeps them pretty warm. Um, the, it is not on its own though, waterproof. So to make it waterproof, 
the beaver has this really interesting set of glands that um, are just above the base of its tail. And they're called uh, often called castor glands. Some people call them anal glands. And they have a, an oil there that the uh, beavers can go ahead and grab the oil and rub it all over their, over their bodies, their front paws. If you can see on my friend here, their front paws look remind me of uh, a raccoon paw or like a little hand like we have. And so they're able to grab that oil, rub it all over their bodies. Um, and then they use this very interesting adaptation on their hind feet. They have one of these on each of their hind feet, um, the second toe in. And this is called, um, it's a special comb like toe. It's called a preening toe and it has a split nail. So do you see how this, uh, the rest of it, the its other nails just look like a single nail. And this one is their preening toe and it looks like a split nail right down the center. They use this like a comb. So after they've wiped the castor oil all over themselves, they use that little preening toe and they comb the oil through their fur and that helps to waterproof their fur. And it'll last for about 15 minutes, which is about the amount of time that a beaver can stay underwater. So it works out well. So they have to, not surprisingly, do this early and often. <laughs> they're, they're always um, preening and adding oil and waterproofing themselves before they, um, they head out to do construction work and to find food. What's uh, another really interesting thing about this is because they uh, do live in family units, there's video of different fam beaver families preening each other. So in the hard to reach areas like, hey, God, you can get my back here where I can't quite reach that. Um, they, they, will, they will help each other out in the hard to reach areas. <laughs> so they'll also use that same um, castorium or castor oil uh, to create what's called scent mounds to mark their territory. So they'll mound up some mud at the boundaries of their territory and they will deposit uh, some of the castor oil on those mounds to let other beavers in the area know that this territory is taken. We are staking our claim with our stinky scent mounds. And I shouldn't say too stinky because actually the castor, castor oil um, has a bit of a vanilla vanilla e scent to it. And it is used in perfumes and at one point was used in food flavorings. Um, I don't think that's happening as much right now, but uh, it, it, I've never tasted it straight from the beaver. So I'm, <laughs> I can't give you a, a, test, a personal testimonial. Uh, all right. So that's the, the fur and grooming. Really important for that beaver to be able to thrive. Next, the tail. The beaver tail is used for so many things. So we're gonna run down the list here of all the benefits of having this flat, broad, scaled tail. Um, first of all, I put the picture of the skeleton in the slide so that you could see what I think is a pretty cool feature. And that is that the spine actually extends all the way down, the vertebrae extend all the way down and through most of the beaver's tail. So it's not just an extension of the body, it truly is an extension of the beaver's spine. And it is very powerful. They use it as a, rud as a rudder when they're swimming. Beavers are much more agile and fast in the water than they are on the land. Um, in the water, they can zoom around super fast and you know gracefully. And then when you see them walking around on land, they're awkward and slow. So <laughs> it's gonna make more sense why they create their habit habitats in the way that they do based on their ease of locomotion. So that tail is uh, all the way, vertebrae all the way through. Um, it also is used to store excess fat to help get them through the winter. So little fat reserves um, can get stored up into, in that tail. Um, during the summer, if it's really, really hot out, they can use that to help release some heat. Sort of like taking your shoes off in bed, you know, your socks off in bed. You can you know, make, cool yourself down a little bit. Um, they'll use it as a stabilizer. So I have a video coming up in the next slide to show you how they use the tail as the stabilizer while they're chomping on a tree. But this particular uh, beaver is showing how they would use the tail when they were starting, when they were in the process of preening. So um, the anal glands, um, and the castor glands are located just above the base of the tail. So he can sit on his tail and go ahead and uh, get the oil right from, um, from the glands and start to spread it around on its body. And probably the most fun way uh, that the beavers use their tail is for communication. 
And that's both communication with the family of beavers in the area and also with predators or people that things that they think might be pre predators. So this particular um, beaver down in the bottom right hand corner has just raised its tail up out of the water and is getting ready to do what we call a tail slap. And that tail slap comes down with, that tail comes down with such force that it makes a giant noise. And so if a predator is spotted, that big tail slap does two things. Number one, it lets the rest of the family know that you need to get under the water and back into the lodge to safety. It also hopefully startles the predator. And I'll give you a quick story. Uh, my husband and I were camping next to a beaver dam, next to a beaver pond. And we both know that beavers tail slap, but we didn't even think about it. And the sun goes down, we'd had our dinner, we were you know, getting into the tent and all of a sudden, and it's you know, real quiet, and all of a sudden there's this big noise. It sounded like somebody threw a rock into the water. And for just a moment, it startled both of us before we realized what it really was, which was just a beaver that was out doing work and heard us and slapped the tail. <laughs> So they, it, it, is, it is startling, and so it does, its, it does its job. All right, uh, I want to play a quick video for you. Our chief ranger, Zach Steele, was actually out at Seneca Ponds on Saturday. It's like the beaver out there just knew that I was doing this program today. And so he was able to get some footage of, well, we call, it, we call him Seneca Sam. It could be Samantha or Samuel, I don't know. <laughs> there's more than one out there, but this is Seneca Sam. And there's some footage I'm gonna play for you. You can see um, the beaver using this tail to prop itself up and chew on, uh, cut that, that downed tree. And he is uh, setting me up for to talk about teeth. That's up next. <laughs> so I think uh, this is the most impressive feature. It's not my favorite, but it's the most impressive, most impressive adaptation that the beaver has, and that is its teeth. So there's a skull in front of you here. I also have a skull um, from the office that I'm just going to use to show you the backside of these teeth. Because beavers are rodents. They have that characteristic two uh, incisors that sit far out on, on the face of the, the animal, top and bottom. So those incisors are a characteristic trait of rodents. So if you saw a line of rodent skulls, everything from a tiny little shrew up through a groundhog up through uh, a big beaver skull, um, they're all going to have, share that, have that in common, that those, those incisors. And the difference with the beaver's incisors is that they will always be this bright orange and the, the skull is much, much larger than anything else that we, any other animal that we, rodent that we have in Ohio. So it has these, uh, this orange coloring on the front. And so I know my first question before I knew the answer was why on earth is it orange? Like, do they need brush? What's going on here? And it turns out that this orange is caused by iron that's in the tooth enamel. And so that iron, the mineral, um, creates this orange coloring and also reinforces and helps strengthen that enamel on the beaver's teeth. Now, just like all other rodents, the beaver's teeth grow constantly. So throughout a rodent's lifespan, their teeth are going to continue to grow. And so in order to keep them from growing to the point that they can't effectively eat, they need to be chewing on things that wear it down. Now in a beaver's case, they're chewing on trees. So this has to be really hard, but it also has to be really sharp. And so you'll notice on the back side, if you look at the back side of the teeth, they're white. So the front side, bright orange, the back side is white. So there's no iron that's here. Um, that's dentin and the teeth are self sharpening. So as they, as they close, they rub against each other. So this top is gonna rub against the bottom. So the soft dentin is gonna rub against the, bot the hard orange on the bottom and the soft dentin on the top teeth are gonna rub against the hard iron on the bottom teeth. 
And they're constantly gonna keep that angled sharp edge, just like you were sharpening a knife blade. In fact, the beaver's teeth are so sharp that they could cut through a person's finger in one chomp, just clean cut, just like you were using a pair of pruners to prune a shrub. So really, really sharp, really hard, and it allows them to go ahead and do things like right here. So this picture, both of these pictures were taken by um, one of our volunteers on Sunday at Seneca Ponds Park because the beavers are getting super active out there. And so this is a pretty large tree, but this is where that uh, misunderstanding about whether or not beavers eat the wood comes into play because, you know, it looks like, gosh, you know, what, what are we doing here? Why do we want it? They don't just go around cutting trees down just for the, yeah, no orthodontist needed at all. <laughs> they don't just go cutting trees down for the heck of it. You know, that's a lot of energy and a lot of work and animals are all about conserving energy and, you know, making things as easy as possible. They cut the tree down so that they have access to the things that they want, which is all of these tender little branches, any of the leaves that like during the growing season, any of the leaves that are on that tree. Um, so primarily they're cutting down trees and shrubs to get gain access to those materials. They also can be cutting them down to get uh, material building supplies for a dam or for some repair jobs. So that's why they cut trees down. So if you have beavers on your property, um, and I saw in the comments brief, I didn't read all of them, but I saw a few come through that uh, folks who've had you know, trees taken down, that's why they're doing it. They're not just going out to take a tree down for the sake of taking the tree down. They have a purpose for it. They're either using it to access food um, or they're using it to access building materials. So those are the two reasons. The next slide, I'm going to talk about what I think are the coolest adaptations of the beavers. And these are all pretty cool already. So this is this is really something. And that's the extra waterproofing. I know we talked about the fur and how they uh, use the oil to waterproof their fur, but they've got all kinds of other adaptations that um, help them be super effective and efficient in the water, okay? So first is the lungs. Their lung size is enormous in comparison to their bodies. And those oversized lungs allow them to stay underwater for long periods of time. They can stay underwater um, on average for about 15 minutes at a time. And I mean, imagine they're not just swimming along underwater, they're doing work. I mean, they are constructing, they are uh, sometimes dragging, uh, dragging food to their food cache. I mean, they're, they're really doing work. Sometimes they're even eating or at least, at least gnawing through things under there. So those oversized lungs allow them to be able to enable them to be able to do that. The next thing they have are some specialized ear and nose valves. So whereas you and I might have to put, you know, earplugs in or a little nose plug to keep water from going up um, into those cavities, the beavers have them built in. So when they dive into water, these valves are closed and it allows them to not get any water in their ear or their nose. Um, they do have great hearing. In fact, um, beavers have tiny little ears, but they have really acute hearing and they are much more likely to hear you approach than to see you approach. Um, so Rebecca and I were talking earlier about um, <laughs> teaching her kids to be really quiet, you know, so they might have a increase. So they have an increased chance of seeing wildlife when they're out, and that is definitely true for beavers. Um, they can't see very well. They uh, they have really a really narrow field of um, of vision, and so they can hear great though. So if you're really really quiet, um, you might be able to sneak up and get a peek at them in action. All right, next up, if you were here for the OWL program with me, then you know that I talked about nictitating eyelids um, with owls. And of course, owls use them to protect their eyes while they're eating or catching their prey. Beavers, on the other hand, use their nictitating eyelid to protect their eyes and allow them to see while they're underwater. All this eyelid is, is an extra eyelid that's perfectly clear that they can see through. So when they dive down, they're ear valves shut, their nose valves shut, and they're, they put on their go-go gadget clear eyelids so they can see underwater. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. They even have um, facial whiskers that they use when it's either really dark water um, or muddy water and they're trying to you know fit through a tunnel. They can use those whiskers to kind of gauge where they're at and make sure they don't run in and run into anything. And finally, they had, have some ad adaptations on their mouth that allow them to do that chewing work while they're underground, underwater. 
they're they're able to take their lips and actually close them behind their teeth. So picture this, you're a beaver, you've got to do a repair down at the base of the dam under the water, you've got this stick <laughs> and you need to get it down there. Well, for us, if we put a stick in our mouth and go under underwater, we're going to get a mouthful of water, right? So the beaver can actually close its mouth behind its teeth so it still can hang on to that stick and do the repair job that it needs or take the food up into the lodge. Um, it can even uh, chew with it. It can, it can even chew with its mouth open. So it needs to cut, you know, snip something off while it's underneath the water, it can do that. Um, those lips can also be used to keep sawdust from getting into its mouth. Really fascinating, in my opinion. <laughs> All right. Um, Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk more about beaver behavior. So I've mentioned about what great engineers and builders they are. Um, I would even throw architects in there. I mean, they do it all. They do all the things. Um, and they uh, are way better than, it's, it's really funny, actually, if, you're, if you've ever tried to um, uh, remediate a challenge that you're having on your property with, um, with a beaver. They are persistent, and they are good at what they do. I have seen dams um, or debris taken out one day. And if there isn't some other kind of remediation that's done, it will be back in place the next day. Um, so they are very fast workers. They are very efficient, efficient workers. But what I, what I want to get across when I'm talking about this is that they're doing it with, with a purpose. And their purpose is to establish a home. So beavers are going to build a, a dam either on a stream like this one, or they're going to take up residence in an existing pond, like Seneca ponds at the park, right? And if they're at a pond, they don't always need to do a need to make a dam. They do hate the sound of running water, so they will, um, if there's a culvert or an overflow, something like that, they will always try to uh, to plug that up and stop that sound. Um, that's not they're not able to do that on a, a stream or uh, moving water, and so sometimes. I, what I've noticed is that beavers that build dams along streams, they don't seem to be quite as concerned about stopping every little sound of water, <laughs> but they do make that a nice secure dam. Beavers are not trying to just create a pond for creating a pond, just like they're not trying to cut down a tree just for the sake of cut, cutting down a tree. What they're trying to do is build a place to put their home. Remember that um, talking about the uh, speed and agility in the water versus on land? Um, that's where this comes into play. You know, the beavers are not good on land. So to increase their chance of survival, they want to create some water because they're fast in the water. They can move in the water. They can get away from predators in the water. They aren't as good at that on land. So if they can avoid coming up on land as much as possible, they are happy little campers. So um, what they're trying to do is establish a pool of water that they can then make a base for, and we'll talk more about how the lodge gets built um, a little bit later, but they're establishing a home base to build a lodge by creating that. When they increase the size of the pool, once the lodge is established, they're doing that to be able to give them access to food. So let's think about Seneca Ponds. Let's say the beaver family there goes ahead and um, <clears throat> takes out all of the trees and small shrubs, all the good food sources, all the way around the pond. The only time that they're gonna be interested in um, changing that water level is once they can't get to any more food. And then they don't wanna go up on land if they don't have to. So they're gonna try and create um, an, a higher water level so that they've got access to that next level of shrubs and trees. Um, so if you think, Think, um, think like a beaver <laughs> and realize that all they're trying to do is get to the food, increase that territory to get to the food. Uh, once a family unit or a colony is established, beavers can be very territorial. Uh, this applies to all wild animals, but please remember to don't approach them, <laughs> let you know, observe them, be so, so happy and grateful that you saw them, but don't approach them. Um, they're more likely to defend their territory against another beaver, but uh, you don't want to push that. You just want to leave, let, leave them be. And any dam, but particularly one on moving water, requires constant, constant maintenance. Um, so this also gives us a clue to why their uh, family units and their colonies are established in the way they are. We'll talk more about that uh, later here. 
I just wanted to give you another, the previous picture was one of uh, moving water. This is an example of a dam in a existing marshy area. And my guess is that this one was built, um, built higher to again, increase that pool to gain access to food. So let's uh, take a closer look at the dam. So this is a graphical representation of a dam. I have a, or of a lodge. I have another photo here of the lodge at Seneca um, Ponds Park in just a moment. I want to draw your attention to a few things. First, the dam. That's where it always starts. If there's already an existing water uh, source, already a pond, like at Seneca Ponds, they don't need to do this step. But um, if it's a, a, a creek or a, a stream, then they're going to go ahead and build a dam first to create that pool. And once they have a raised water level, the next thing they do is build a platform. It's like building a foundation for your house. So they're building the, the platform out of mud and sticks for their lodge. Um, next, they start to build um, a big mound of uh, using both mud and sticks, to all different sizes, they'll build this big mound. And it looks really haphazard, but when you really get into it, it is a sturdy structure and it's lined with mud and it is has such a high insulation <laughs> power that it keeps them nice and toasty in there all through the winter. So when you go out to a park or see a, um, a beaver lodge during the winter, like at Seneca Ponds, those beavers are still happy and cozy and warm in their, uh, in their lodge all winter. And they're able to still get food even if this is frozen over because they have prepared for winter usually either next to or very close to the, one of the entrances to the lodge, you'll see a, a pile of, of sticks and twigs and limbs. Usually on the surface, it doesn't look like that. Sometimes it looks like a giant pile, but often it doesn't look like a giant pile, but it's all the way down underground. And that's their food cache, C-A-C-H-E, their food cache. And it's their food storage. And so they build on that food storage all season. So that way during the winter, they've got something to eat when they either can't get access to the, uh, the trees and the shrubs or there's not, um, or there's not, e there's not enough. So um, that's what their cash is for. Also, I just wanna point out one more thing and that is that the, there's always more than one underground entrance to a beaver lodge. So they don't just have one way in and out. There's always um, at least two ways in and out of the Beaver Lodge, but always underwater. So you won't have any access points um, above water and that's to protect them from predators. So the only um, predator that is gonna be able to get in there easily would be a river otter. So we do have river otters that have you know, come back into the area and they will um, swim up into a beaver lodge and grab the babies, which they're called kits, K-I-T-S. Um, they, will, they will predate those. Uh, but otherwise, this protects them from just about everybody else. A coyote or a fox or a raptor aren't going to be able to get into the lodge. So pretty, pretty nice, uh, nice, nice system here. And again, um, once a beaver uh, goes ahead and mows down and gains access to those twigs and leaves from the, the trees that are close, if they can't, if, it, if they feel like it's not safe to go up and grab that tree, their preference would be to build that dam higher so that it raises the water level so they can swim up closer to that tree because they can't move very fast um, on land. This picture is a picture of the Beaver Lodge at Seneca Ponds Park. Um, if you uh, are going along the beaver loop, you can, you can see it to your right. Um, and then you can see the back side of it when you come along around the swan loop. And obviously we can't see where the entrances are, but they're there and there's a little cache of, of uh, twigs that are sticking out of the water on the other side of it. And so that's where our Seneca Sam and family are hold, get, you know, hold up throughout the year. I wanted to show you this video and photos just as a, uh, a different example of a beaver dam. Um, this is actually the, the spot that we were camping when we had the big, the big uh, slap, tail slap. And I just wanted to draw your attention, kind of lay out the land here. Um, so right here is the beaver dam. And this is a stream. It's about a 200 acre watershed you know, that drains down through here. So it's a pretty decent size, size stream. They don't, um, it, this one often blows out after a, 
after a, a large rain because there's a lot of water that comes down through there. But I mean, I've been going to this spot for um, about 20 years and they, they rebuild. Like the most that I've ever seen it unattended is maybe a year, maybe a season before a new family moved in. So this is the same as this dam here. You can see all that, that fresh vegetation. So this is a newly repaired or patched, um, patched dam. They, these require a lot more maintenance than in a, uh, in a, uh, in a, a pond that doesn't have um, that constant flow. So uh, they use a combination of mud and different sizes of sticks to build a dam especially across a moving body of water. They'll down a tree um, or put some large, larger limbs there first and then build off of that. It's really impressive. If you get a chance, please take a closer look at a beaver dam if you happen to see one because wow, do they ever, um, it, it, do, they ever do a great job <laughs> of, of engineering. And then this area, this is the backside view. So this photo was taken from standing across the pond, looking over. And this vegetated mound here is actually the beaver lodge in this case. Remember I said they like to be out in the water. So what these beavers have done is actually created two dams. So the, the stream comes around here. The majority of it goes over this this dam, but then there's another one that you can't really see in this picture that goes off to the right side and then they meet again and continue downstream, essentially creating an island on which the beavers have constructed their lodge. So that's also a pretty sweet little setup there. And they'll continue to expand this water level to be able to access those larger trees and shrubs. Um, if you have things planted or if they're um, if the environment has um, plants like willows, some of our native willows, they regenerate or dogwoods, shrub dogwoods like redozers and gray dogwoods and silky dogwoods. Um, they grow really fast and those are great beaver. Beavers love to eat them and they're, they're a great food source and they regenerate fast. And so um, having a lot of those there can, I mean, that can really support a, a small family of beavers for a while. Right here, as this is playing, this video is playing, you're going to see a little beaver pop its head up and swim around here to uh, tackle a stick. Up oh, there he is, popped his head up. You'll see him yanking on the, the stick there. And then he goes under and swims back around. This patch of vegetation that's here, in about 15 minutes of watching this beaver work, this was completely gone. The beaver kept taking big chunks of that little vegetative island and swimming over and stuffing it into the into the, the dam here and using the mud to patch up any holes. Um, it was amazing how fast that disappeared. All right. Next up, let's talk about the family. I see, let's see here. So that this should answer some of your questions about the family unit of the uh, of the beavers. So they do they are monogamous. Um, in fact, they essentially mate for life or until um, I mean, they will get another mate. Um, if one of them dies, they will get another one. Something that's interesting about beavers is that you can't tell the difference um, between a male and female. Um, they have a cloaca um, that has, they, they don't have any external sex organs um, and like everything comes out the same hole. So, <laughs> so they, you can't tell the difference between a male and female just by looking at them. Um, females do tend to be slightly larger, but um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Most of the time we don't see them even out of the water. So that's why that Seneca Sam video was really exciting. We usually see them working in the water because that's where they prefer to be. They're, they're very, uh, um, susceptible, you know, they're, they're not safe when they're out of, out of the water. So they establish a colony. A, basically a beaver family is called a colony. So the colony is made up of the parents, so like the first ones, and the kits, those are the babies, from the current year. So breeding season for beavers is in January and February. So we're, um, the beavers are pregnant now, <laughs> and they will give birth to, um, on average, two to four kits, although it can be up to eight, you know, depending on, on the, the beaver and depending on the, um, the health and the food availability. So 
they will have the parents and the babies from this year, but then they'll also have last year's young as part of the colony. And then sometimes if there's enough food available, they'll even have the previous year's young. So a colony of beavers is anywhere from two to 12 uh, beavers. Usually there's less than that because especially in Northeast Ohio, we don't have these large landscapes that would be able to support uh, that large of a colony. So we tend to see smaller ones that have, you know, like eight or less uh, beavers in them. And so what happens is um, the parents are like, hey, older siblings, <laughs> we're going to have you help raise the babies. So they help teach the babies, you know, how to, um, how to eat. They, they help, uh, help them help them preen, you know, help them groom. Um, but everybody has to pitch in and help maintain the territory. And so by territory, I mean the dam, any of, you know, patching up any of those holes. Um, so all of those things um, are, are done by the entire family. So they, it is a teamwork effort. They work together. Um, the gestation period, I didn't mention that, is um, a little over 100 days, like 107 days for um, for the baby. So they mate in January or February. So a few months later, you'll have the cute little baby um, beavers born and they are adorable. They do come out fully furred um, and uh, they, they're, they're pretty darn cute if you're fortunate enough to see them out and about, which would be rare because they are um, obviously more susceptible to predators than um, the parents or than the adults. So once there's not enough food, and the parents are like, hey, older siblings, it is time for you guys to get out on your own. And so when they kick them out, then those adult beavers, young adult beavers will go and establish their own territories um, and will um, find different mates. What's funny um, and interesting about these, these family units is that sometimes if there's enough area, you'll actually see the young adults just move downstream. It's like moving next door to mom and dad. You know, like they'll set their territory up just a little ways downstream. And uh, there's a spot that it used to be owned by the Nature Conservancy. I'm not sure it's been years since I've been up there, but up near Holden Arboretum, there's a perched wetland. Um, and you can actually see multiple um, you know, series of beaver dams that are all different colony territories that are set up. So really interesting. But yeah, the parents kick them out at some point. Um, beavers are pretty long lived. So they average about 10 years, um, but can be frequently, you know, upwards of 20 years, um, years old. So uh, that's, they, they can live a good long life. And they will move out um, if there's not enough food. So if they got to a point where they, this, this habitat wasn't serving them, um, they either couldn't get the water level up where they needed it or where they wanted it, or there just plain wasn't enough food available, they will move out and find, you know, set up a, a colony um, in a more hospitable location. So let's talk ecological impact. This is not Ohio, <laughs> but I love this. And we certainly have um, good photos of uh, beaver habitat, good aerial photos, but I love this one just to show the comparison between um, a habitat that has beavers present and a habitat that doesn't right in the same stream. So on the right hand side, this is in Utah, on the right hand side, um, this area does not have, of, of the stream does not have beavers um, in it. Now this entire area is uh, pastured, it's ranch land. And so this is pastured up to the edge. And you, we do see a few um, different kinds of uh, either shrubs or small trees that are here, but the majority of it um, is your know, lower vegetation. But this is actually the same, it's just blown up, this section upstream here. And this section of the same, same stream has a beaver dam here. You can see this beaver dam go all the way across the length of the stream. And there's a few things that are interesting here. The one that I think is most notable is all the differences in vegetation. So even if we don't know what plants are there, you can tell by the colors, the shapes, and the textures of this picture that there are lots of different types of plants growing and thriving in that area. Now, what do we know about diversity and the environment? The diversity is one of the major, major indications that you, are, you have a healthy habitat. So the higher the diversity of plants and animals, that a habitat can support, the healthier that habitat or ecosystem is. 
So, um, and that stands true for any, you know, any, any ecosystem that we have here, more diversity, healthier. And so here we have lots of different plants that are here. And presumably then, um, I bet that if we went ahead and sampled and surveyed the animal life that was there, both in the water and above the water, we would see a much greater diversity of animal life here than here, just because there's a greater diversity of plants um, and of the landscape to support these different animals. And so that's the type of ecological impact that we do see um, from the beavers. In fact, if you go, if you've ever visited Canada, um, even up into the, the UP, there's a lot, um, they've recognized that there's a lot more benefits that come from this type of a system than from this type of a system. And so it's welcome the, the, the impact that the beavers have. And that's where that keystone species status comes in because without the beaver, if the beaver leaves here, this rich, diverse habitat um, becomes this less rich and less diverse habitat. Um, just by the presence of the beaver, it creates this different habitat. So that's why it's considered a keystone species. So finally, I just want to end tonight, and then I have left some time for to answer any questions that you have. Um, talk a little bit about, I'd like to talk a little about conservation and management. So first, we've already touched on habitat creation, but I just want to drive home the point that um, when a beaver moves into an area and creates these beaver ponds or um, wetlands or you know, changes the landscape, um, it's also opening up these new niches for different types of plant and animal species. Um, things like dragonflies and damselflies, you'll see an increase in those. Um, in other amphibians, depending on, especially depending on the area that the beaver constructs in, um, you could create, it can create new breeding sites for uh, different amphibians. Uh, even reptiles and birds, oh my goodness, with birds, both nesting birds and our wading birds, um, because you've increased the, um, the area for aquatic habitat, aquatic inhabitants, you've now increased the food source um, for some of our, our larger birds or our birds that eat, eat fish and other crustaceans. And it changes the plant community. So even here at Seneca, this is Seneca Sam at Seneca Ponds, um, even at Seneca Ponds, what you'll notice is the areas where um, the beaver has taken down trees, soon you'll start to see different plants pop up out of the, what we call the seed source. So what's already in the, um, in the soil suddenly there's light and it stimulates those plants to germinate and to grow. So it can, it can change, the, um, ch change the area in really some delightful and amazing, amazing ways. It also has an impact on water and soil. So um, stay with me here. <laughs> For water, there's a few different ways that it can impact. Um, you, you get stormwater management from these types of uh, beaver ponds where it slows down the water. Um, those of you who are uh, like me love rain gardens. I, I always talk about rain gardens being like a little stormwater speed bump, kind of slows the water down and lets it soak into the ground. Similar thing happens with um, anytime there's a, a beaver dam that's installed. You know, it slows the water down, lets it recharge that groundwater. It also can, in some cases, reduce stream bank erosion upstream. Um, it can in improve water quality in and of itself because you've got different vegetation that's there to be able to uptake that um, any pollutants that are in the water um, and help it help improve water quality in that way. And then finally, there are some soil improvements that happen after the beaver moves out because you've got years sometimes of um, vegetation that um, is decomposing. And once the beaver moves out, that area will often slowly revert um, through some different stages of and different types of wetlands um, and you end up with a richer soil uh, material that's left. Um, but we do have human conflict that happens and like I mentioned before because we live in northeast Ohio there's a very high concentration of beavers compared to other places in the state and there's also a lot of people here. <laughs> so we do get things like stuffed culverts, you know clogged up culverts. Um, we do get uh, roadways that are affected by the backup of water from a beaver dam or sometimes even structures that are affected by that. And so when that happens um, your best bet and I will send this link out when uh, once you get the email with the recording link that includes the Ohio Division of Wildlife's nuisance trappers list. 
it is, you do need to have, um, for trapping beavers, it needs to either be done um, with a license during the trapping season, which is usually like December through, um, December through February. You want to check the hunting and trapping regs to be sure on the dates. Um, so you can either, either do that, or um, if you have a nuisance beaver that uh, you, you need taken, you know, take removed from the area, then you can um, hire a, somebody from the nuisance trappers list that the Division of Wildlife puts out and they can come and trap the, um, the beaver out. Um, alternatively, there are some structural, um, there are some structural things that you can build or install that will either uh, frustrate the beaver. So eventually they decide this is not the place I wanna be because I am physically unable to get the water level to where I need it to be. Um, or will like frustrate the beaver enough that, okay, fine, I'll work with what I have here. I'm not going to try and go any, any higher. And some of those, um, those structural things, I recommend contacting the um, Soil and Water Conservation District. So if you live in Portage County, go to the Portage SWCD. If you live in a different county, um, go to your county's local soil and water district, and they should have plans for some of those different, um, different uh, structural things that you can put in to dissuade the, the beaver. Because uh, this can be filled up in an evening again. <laughs> so um, if you don't figure something else out, it'll just be a continual clean out process. All right. So I hope you learned something and I hope you have a better appreciation for how cool these critters are. Um, I would love to take some questions here. Uh, Rebecca, do we have any questions in the chat box that came up? There are a few, um, but I think she may have moved them over to the oh. Q&A box if you want to check there. Okay, cool. All right, we'll do these first. Um, all right, got a couple questions. Are the anal glands, oh, hey, Andrea. <laughs> Are the anal glands like those on our canines? Um, similar in the sense that they are located um, it, it, in terms of the beaver, they've got a cloaca, not really an anus. And so um, it's similar, but not exactly the same. <laughs> similar idea though, not nearly as stinky. <laughs> And let's see, another question. I really get the habitat formation ecological impact that the beaver can have. How is taking out human-made river dams different? The dams removed by the Cuyahoga River, good question, um, to benefit the river and its environment, but a beaver dam in the same place appears to be beneficial. Awesome question. So the first part of that is that um, the Cuyahoga River, there would not be a beaver um, in North America that would be able to dam up the Cuyahoga. <laughs> So that's the big difference is that they're, they uh, build dams along smaller stream systems, usually tri tributaries with smaller watersheds. Um, those areas um, historically had more wetlands um, and had more um, pools and are lower flow. They have a lower flow rate. They have a smaller watershed that drains into them. And so those areas benefit um, because you're, you're not really blocking up flow. You're not creating a deep dam pool. You're also not um, creating a, a situation where you've got uh, fish that, are, uh, that, that live in deeper waters and migrate up into smaller waters. Um, so in those cases, like on the Cuyahoga, a lot of those will actually prevent that um, fish migration, that movement, um, plus it creates a much um, deeper, bigger dam pool behind it. So that's a very good question, though. Um, beavers aren't going to block up um, large river systems. They're just physically unable to do that. So they, um, they have impact on the smaller um, watersheds, smaller streams, smaller creeks. So I hope that answered your question, Jane. If you have a follow-up to that, please, please ask it because that is a, that's a fascinating rabbit hole to get down. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Um, will we get to the point? Oh, will we get to the point where there will be too many? Oh, I'm glad you asked this question, Jane. Will we get to the point that there will be too many beavers at Seneca Ponds? And if so, what would we do about it? Good question. So um, the answer is, that is unlikely. And the reason is um, beavers are pretty self-regulating is um, if there's not enough food and it's not, and, and at Seneca, because um, our operations and maintenance staff will keep the, we've got some baffles that are on the culverts um, that keep the beavers from being able to do what they'd love to do, which is to raise the water level a lot higher. Because of that, it's going to limit the number of beavers that can actually live 
in those ponds. Um, and so more than likely we don't have, you know, six to eight uh, animal colonies at Seneca um, because there's not enough food for them because they can't get the water level up to where they want it. So um, they move to a different, different spot. That's a good question. Um, laws and regulations about destroying dams. Yeah, so that's where the nuisance trappers um, come in. Um, you do need to check with Division of Wildlife when it comes to um, comes to any of that. There's there's some health and there's some public um, like public safety things that that come into laws that come into play to protect roadways and right of ways things like that. Um, but definitely check with Division of Wildlife before you um, do any alteration to uh, a dam. Hopefully I got, oh, do they need to, oh, do they need to waterproof all year or just in the winter? Good question. All year. They need to waterproof all year. So uh, you'll see them, uh, especially if you do a, uh, there's some organizations that if you, if you look up beaver live cams, there's some organizations that have um, uh, night vision cameras on, on or near the lodge. And you'll see them just preening and grooming each other because they do uh, use that that waterproofing all all season. Okay, uh, do beavers? Oh, all kinds of questions. This is so great. Okay, uh, do beavers live in bogs? So uh, they can. Sure, they definitely can, Becky. Yeah, um, you'll see uh, Triangle Lake Bog, which is a state nature preserve. Um, there's a, a a channel, a man-made channel that uh, came, you know comes through uh, that, that bog and you, you can definitely see beaver activity there. Um, Seneca Sam seems to be okay with people. How should we interact or not interact? Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, um, you really should leave the wildlife as, leave, leave, give it its space, leave them be. So if you are fortunate enough to um, come around the corner on the beaver trail at Seneca Ponds and uh, see the beavers in action there, keep your distance, watch them, enjoy, do not approach them, do not try and get a close-up shot, um, leave them be. If they, um, if they for some reason start um, acting differently, then continue down the trail, <laughs> give them their space. So where do the beavers go from Seneca? Some of them need to move. Um, downstream, Jan, I mean, if you look at, uh, an air, if you look at aerial photos of Portage County, we are rich in water resources here and there are lots of places to, to go. So they'll follow those drainage patterns either downstream or upstream in search of uh, new territory and new ground. Okay, since trapping beavers is a temporary solution, since as long as there's good habitat, more will move in. Beaver baffles, do you start? yep. Yeah, that's exactly, Matt, good question. That is, um, can have all the benefits of the beaver and their habitat without the negative flooding, exactly. Um, that's why I mentioned if you have a beaver that is um, continually you know, clogging up a culvert or building a dam and flooding an area, um, to check with your soil and water conservation district about uh, different structures that can be built or that can be put in place to either frustrate that beaver so that it um, you know, moves on or more likely, um, have it adjust its, its family or colony size. Good questions. Has there ever been any beavers at Twin Lakes or Trail Lake? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, um, uh, our executive director, um, Christine Craycroft, I was talking with her this morning and she just saw um, some be a beaver at Lake Pippin, you know, from along the lakeside trail. And you're not allowed to, Lake Pippin is actually the city of Akron's property, um, but Towner's Woods Park butts right up against that. And if you want beautiful views of Lake Pippin, you can use the lakeside trail at, uh, at Towner's Woods and see, you know, see and enjoy the lake. And so uh, she observed a beaver uh, swimming, swimming in Lake Pippin too. And same is true for Twin Lakes. Um, we do see some beaver evidence at Trail Lake. I've not yet, and Andrew, if you want to pop in, if you've seen one, I have not yet seen the actual, an actual beaver at Trail Lake, but there's definitely evidence that they're around. If I missed a question that you asked and it got lost in the chat box, um, either pop it in the Q&A, or if you think of something when we get off the uh, call tonight, you can just shoot me an email. I am happy to, to answer any questions that you that you have. I really recommend that you um, look up that uh, Ohio beaver survey with Division of Wildlife because it's got some really interesting information in it about the population and the numbers. Um, 
And uh, I'm so appreciate everybody being here tonight and joining us and uh, welcoming Rebecca. To <laughs>